Good morning. Good morning. Somebody's granddaughter is not happy. We should probably take care of that. <laughs> not Super Bowl Sunday yet. <laughs> Um, actually, well, before we start, I wanted to uh, say a prayer. I know there are a, a number of people that are out with this flu thing. I know earlier this week, Matthew and Angie both had it. I know Steve has it now. I'm sure that it's, it's making its way around the valley and it's making its way through our congregation. So I just want to uh, lift these people up. Okay, So if you join me, Father, we thank you that you are the divine healer. We thank you, Father, that there's no situation that we're in where you are not there with us. And so, Father, we lift up uh, those that are sick today. I pray especially for Steve as he's struggling with the fever and the cough and just not feeling well, Father. I ask for a divine touch on him. I thank you, Father, for the, the speedy recovery from Matthew and Angie. And we ask for the same for Steve. And Father, for those that we don't know that are also feeling not well today, we just ask that you would be with them, that you would restore them to our fellowship with me, Father. Bless you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, today is one of those messages that I know I'm going to get a black eye for. <laughs> And it's one of those things that, uh, as, a, as a pastor, you know, it's one of those uncomfortable places. It's a place that you kind of rather just avoid and skip to the comfortable places. Let's, let's just deal with how much God loves us and how we're all children of the King and we're joint heirs to the kingdom and we get good things and, and everybody walks away happy and feeling good about themselves. This isn't one of those days. Um, we're, I'm going to start off with this because we're wrapping up what Paul is talking to the Colossians about. He, he's talking to them about interpersonal relationships. We've talked about husbands and wives. We've talked about parents and children. Today we're going to talk about slaves and masters. <clears throat> we're going to wrap this section up. okay? But there's one thing that I, I need to bring our focus back to. Our focus always has to be here. Your response is your responsibility. Okay? Make a note of that. Get a pen. Write it down. This is the key to everything that I've been talking about for the last three weeks. Your response is your responsibility. Okay? Because ultimately, I can complain and gripe at my wife all I want. And I can point out the scriptures that are written to her. And when I stand before God, he's not going to ask me about how well I managed my wife. I can grab and complain to my children and point out all the scriptures that deal with them. And when I stand before God, who is he going to ask me about? He's going to ask me about me. Because, see, there's a lot of scriptures in here that are directed to me. Now, a couple weeks ago I spoke and I said, Wives, when a passage in scripture is directed to husbands, mind your own business, M-Y-O-B. Husbands, likewise, when a passage is directed to your wives... Mind your own business. Look to your own house. Okay? It's very easy to sit in judgment on how somebody else is not fulfilling their part of the bargain. But God has called us to take care of the plank in our own eye first. Children, when he's talking to the parents, mind your own business. I hated MYOB. My mom used to say that all the time. 
say, hey, do you know what so-and-so is doing? M-Y-O-B. M-Y-O-B. I just made it my business. Parents, when they're talking to children, the only way that relates to you is then that you are a child and you are someone's child. Mind your own business. Okay? Now, we're going to deal with slaves and masters. So if you're there, uh, we're in Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to back up. I'm just going to read to catch us up where we are. And I'm actually backing up to verse 17. Okay? So Colossians 3.17, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now, that should be an easy one because that was your memory verse two weeks ago. How many got it memorized? Lame. <laughs> Lame. There will be a test, by the way. There will be a test. <clears throat> well, in this life or the next. <laughs> Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there. Okay? Today we're re dealing with verse 22. Okay? And then I'm going to kind of summarize those, those three or four verses right there. I don't like this translation. Okay? And I'll tell you why. In America, in, in the current society, we don't like the word slave. Because we have this very negative idea of what came with slavery. And that harkens back to the, the early stages of America. And, and so we have this negative idea of slavery. It's like, you know, and we, we think of scarred backs and families separated and, and things of that type. And the problem that I have is that cultural identity has made its way into our scripture. And we see that right here where it says bond servants. Okay? Because the word literally means a slave. Okay? You are under someone else's authority. Now, we're not going to repeat the Civil War. I just want to share with you. God has a radically different idea of slavery than we do. Because God understands that we're all slaves. Okay? Read His Word with open eyes. He understands that you will serve a master. We deceive ourselves into thinking that we are masters of our own fate. I got this. But who are you serving really? Because if you're not serving God, there's only one alternative left. And that's Satan. Now you go, oh no, I don't bow down to him. Well, if you're not bowing to God, Satan has won. He is your master because he has taken you away from your rightful master. Okay? So God understands we're all slaves. Now the word in here, bond servant, that's okay. It's okay. I don't think it's the best translation, but it's okay. And the idea behind a bond servant is somebody that willingly enters into service to another. Okay? Um, <clears throat> you know, and I, I, I don't know if you've heard it. I'll, I'll share with you. There was laid out in scripture that if you were given your manumission as a slave, if you were set free, but you loved the people that you served for, you could relinquish your right to that freedom and place yourself back under servitude to them. And, and the symbol for that was they would take your ear and they put it up to the doorpost and they take an awl and <clears throat> right through your ear. Okay? And that would indicate that you were now a lifelong servant to them by your own choice. Paul alludes to this when he talks about us becoming bond servants, that we forsake our earthly masters, that we forsake the masters of this world, and we take upon a bond servant to Christ. Again, the word there is just slave. The only difference is you're volunteering for it. Okay? We understand 
we should understand as Christians that we are bound to God. That we are subject to Him. That we owe Him everything. Our obedient, obedience, our allegiance, our submission, our love, our adoration, our adulation, our praise. Super Bowl next week, the Broncos are playing. Okay? And I guarantee you, when the Broncos win, <laughs> some other team. Oh, Seattle. <laughs> like I said, some other team. I guarantee you that if the Broncos score a touchdown, there's going to be some excited people. There's probably going to be a couple excited people if the Seattle Seahawks score a touchdown. I know at least two. <laughs> but I guarantee you that you will see excitement from those people such as you will never see in most churches. But God doesn't score touchdowns. Really? The cross was the biggest touchdown ever. It was the biggest victory ever. What touchdown ever defeated death? What sport? I'm, now, I'm, I'm making a personal map. Okay? What goal in hockey ever <laughs> defeated death? What, what hockey team ever restored right relationship between a broken sinner and his creator by winning the Stanley Cup? And yet, when the Colorado Avalanche won the Stanley Cup, you bet I shouted. I shouted twice. <clears throat> because the first time they won, Houston was flooding. And they canceled the seventh game of the Stanley Cup Finals. So I could watch people getting in and out of boats. <laughs> really? This is the Stanley Cup Final. We get floods in Houston all the time. I think it's stock footage. <laughs> but there's only one Stanley Cup final, seventh game, this year. And it's the only one that has been in since. So I shouted when I got the report that they won. And then I shouted again at 2 o'clock in the morning when I watched the replay. <laughs> when they finally put it back on television. I had to be that one a little quieter because Christy was in bed. <laughs> but I think about the things that God does for me. Now, the cross in and of itself is sufficient. God owes us nothing. He gave us the cross. Okay? God gave us salvation. And if that were all He ever did for us, that would be sufficient. But He doesn't stop there because He is a good God. He looks out for his people. He blesses his people. He pours out abundant things to his people. Oftentimes, we don't even understand that they're blessings. We, we just don't get it. How often do we cheer for him? So, let's look back at this that Paul is saying. Because in, the, in his time, there were slaves. Now we look at how God laid out slavery in the Old Testament and it was nothing like we saw in the United States of America. It was a radically different thing. Okay? I'm not saying God endorses slavery. I'm, I'm, let's not even go there. I think God was aware of it and made use of it. Okay? But Paul is dealing with a reality at that time And he says, bond servants, slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Now, how can we relate this to us? Well, let's, let's look at this for a moment. Do we have earthly masters? Well, who would be our earthly masters? 
You betcha. You betcha. Now, do you have a boss? Yeah, I got one. That's you guys. But I've had other bosses. Now, when you are an employee, what does God say? Let's, let's just correlate this. Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. And obey your bosses. <clears throat> hmm. Not by way of eye service. Ah, uh, everybody, every business has one. The brown person. <laughs> they have no skill at all except kissing up to the boss for which they are gainfully employed. But as soon as the boss is away, they're often the worst in consideration to their boss. Not by way of eye service. Okay, so we have an employer. How do we deal with this employer? Are we supposed to just do what's sufficient? Do we just do enough? Are we really working for them as we would work for God? In a little while, we're going to be talking about finances. Okay, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the Financial Peace University. That's a separate thing. But I'm actually going to do a series of messages on, on finances. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is that God expects you and me to do an honest day's work for an honest day's dollar. And how we really slack off on that. How oftentimes we get our 15 minute break and it stretches into 30. And we're to be there at 8 and we'll show up at 8.10. And we're supposed to be there till 5 and we duck out at 4.30. And lunch is supposed to be half an hour, but we got 45 minutes. And all of a sudden, the needs of the company are subjected to the needs of discussing whatever around the water cooler. <clears throat> Listen, your employer may never find out. Well, to be honest with you, most of the time they know. But they might never find out. But your master knows. And to him who knows all and divides the intent of the heart, you will give an account. You will stand before God on one day and you will explain to him why you got paid for 40 hours worth of work and you did 22. And you are not sincere in your endeavor. Oh, they're only paying me minimum wage. I'm worth more than that. So I'm only going to give them minimum wage work. Garbage. Garbage. Listen to me. I don't care what position you have. I don't care if you own your own business or you're flipping burgers for somebody else. I don't care if you're pulling down half a million a year or more. Every job you have, you work at to the best of your ability. I don't care if your boss is a jerk. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Because you're not doing it for them. We understand? We're doing it unto him. Let's look at this again. Let's read this again. We have to get this. Members of Jesus Community Church, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. Not by way of eye service. Not just when they're watching you. Not when they're checking out what's going on. But with sincerity of heart. Fearing the Lord. You catch that last phrase there? Do you understand that God is to be 
fear. We don't really grasp this. And I've heard pastors, I, I, I've even on occasion said this, it's not so much fear as respect. I've rethought that. I don't think I agree with that. I think it's fear. I think when we stand before him on that day, our knees will turn to jelly. And down on our faces we will go. Because he's awesome. He's awesome. Awesome. Think about Moses. He just caught the train of his robe and his face glowed. They had to put a rag over it. They're like, dude, you're kind of freaking me out. <laughs> you cover that up. Now, most times you wouldn't take that as a compliment, somebody asking you to cover your face up. I don't. Think about those that have seen him, that have had visions of him. What is their first response? Fear. He's awesome. Think about this. You know, we go, oh, with the very word, he could just annihilate you. No. All he has to do is stop saying the word, and you cease. It's by his very word that everything is held together. All he's got to do is stop wanting you to be together. Fear the Lord. In another passage it says, Why do you fear those that can harm the body, but cannot harm the soul? Better to fear the one that can harm both. Right? So, employees, employers. What if you are the employer? Who's your boss? I own my own company. Who's your boss? Customers. Yep. Customers. You owe the customer honest work, working on their behalf, not cutting corners, not doing things on the sly, not trying to increase the top dollar. Now, I know several of you that own companies, and I've got to say, I am blessed with those of you that I know, because I see you going above and beyond. I see you in cases where, hey, look, I could push three people through my store and make three times the amount of money, but I'm spending the time to help this one person figure it out. I've seen others who say, my time is valuable, but I'm going to stop what I'm doing and I'm going to take some of that time to help out the church or people in the church. And that's a blessing. And I'm telling you right now that God blesses you for that. But don't forget, it's not a one and done. It's a lifelong thing. Okay? It's a lifelong thing. This is a pattern, a trait, that should be indicative of everything we're about. Are we doing it honestly? Are we doing it with sincerity of heart? Are we doing it fearing the Lord? Because see, all of this is hand in glove. Husbands, how you treat your wives. Wives, how you treat your husbands. Parents, how you deal with your children. Children, how you deal with your parents. Employees, how you deal with your employers. Employers, how you deal with your customers. All of this goes, to, this is all interpersonal relationship. This is how God wants it, requires it to work. Do you understand that? This is important. Because if we walk away from this, shrugging our shoulder to it, we will stand before him, and he's going to ask, why didn't you do as I asked? I'm always struck. I, I, I am always struck. And it seems to come up to me often when I'm just reading through the Bible. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord and do not do what I say? And that always catches me. Because I have to re-examine my life and figure out where I'm not doing what he's asked me to do.
Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Hmm. <coughs> when we talked about husbands and wives, one of the things that I shared with you is that husbands, God has called us to love our wives as Christ has loved the church. And really, if we do that, if we endeavor honestly with sincerity of heart, with application of will, what wife wouldn't want to honor that? Let's apply that same thing to employee employers for the work situation. Don't do it as unto them. Do it as unto the Lord. Okay. But he doesn't stop there. Because he carries on to the next verse. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. See, it's not just about do this or I'm going to smack you. We talked about that last week. Positive reinforcement versus negative reinforcement. God does both. Listen, if the still, small voice is not enough, the two by four is coming. Because he will get your attention. And if we are foolish enough and stubborn enough to ignore the still, small voice, things will get bad. He will make things bad. He will make it so we come running back to him, to safety. You are serving the Lord Christ. Now here's a warning, okay? This is, we're wrapping up chapter 3 right here. He says, For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality. No partiality. Listen, when you stand before him and he says, Okay, what about this 22 hours worth of work for 40 hours of pay? And you go, yeah, but he was a jerk. He was only paying me X amount of dollars, and I'm worth more than that. There's no partiality. You know the good you ought to do. You don't do it, you sin. Okay? You sin. So there's the positive reinforcement. There's an inheritance. There's a reward. Look, this is something I had to spend a lot of time learning. We should be striving for rewards. Because I had this weird idea in my head, this false sense of humility that, oh no, it's, it's, I'm, I'm just doing it for God. If God says it's important, that, important enough that He's going to reward you, it's important enough to know that He's going to reward you. Now, don't get me wrong, because when we get to heaven, we're not going to be measuring my account versus your account. We're both going to be taking our accounts and we're going to be throwing them out at his feet. I want a lot to throw at his feet. Okay? And the only way to get that is doing things like this. Wow. That's not what I was. So rewards. Not salvation. Don't. Let's not get this confused. This is not unto salvation then all of this is dressed to those who are saved. So you're not working on salvation. You're not going to impress God enough to get into heaven by doing this. This command is to those who are already His children. Those that already have the path into heaven. The blood of the Lamb. Okay. So this, this is not unto salvation. This is to the rewards for those that do as He commanded. That are pleasing servants unto Him. Okay. Negative side of it is, you don't do what he says, you're judged. You will be repaid. Now, how that works in heaven, I, to be honest with you, I don't know. That's why he's God and I'm not. Okay? I, I don't know what it means when you have salvation and you get to heaven and you're judged for wrongdoing. Quite honestly, my, my personal opinion is you're going to see it in the light that it is and that's going to be shame enough. I think when you get to heaven and you're flipping your corner of rewards and you look around and you see people with wagon poles, I think that's going to be shame enough. When you go to lay your reward before him at his feet, I think that's going to be shame enough. 
But, but I don't, God hasn't revealed to me. He hasn't spoken to me about this stuff. He does that a lot, you know, not talking to me about stuff because he doesn't need to check it with me. You know? And he doesn't need to check it with you either. That's why he's God and we're not. Now, I'm going to back up because there's one thing that I want to address in all of this. What if your spouse is ungodly? What if your parents are ungodly? What if your employer is ungodly? What happens then? Are we required to obey? Well, what if they are from an opposing political party? <laughs> or what if they just have a lifestyle that is contrary to mine? What if they're evil? Because there are evil people out there. And I don't just mean sinners that have not yet been saved. I mean there are people that are evil. That are handy tools for the devil to accomplish what he wants done. There are foolish people out there like that. What if one of those is in your life? Are you still required to obey? <gasps> hmm. Let's look at 1 Peter. Flip over there with me. Because I want to settle in your mind some things. First Peter, I'm in chapter 2. I've actually got quite a bit to read, so, so bear with me, okay? Because I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about this. I'm going to let it speak for itself, okay? So open your ears and open your hearts to what God would say to you, okay? And then we're going to go on from here because there's some things to address. So verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil, and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone of the brotherhood. Fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure but if when you do good and shame or suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in turn. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued in trusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We're not done yet. Keep reading. Likewise, likewise, as in... Everything that I just said, we're applying here. Likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of jewelry, or the clothing you wear. 
But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a quiet and gentle spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who uh, hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, <coughs> Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Do you catch what Peter is telling us? Okay. Obey your earthly masters. Okay. You understand that God established them and put them in place at his will to accomplish his purposes. All of them. All of them. The good and the evil. The good and the evil. We talked about this uh, a while back. You know who the emperor was when Peter was writing this? Nope, not Nero. Domitian. Now if you remember, there were two major persecutions by the Roman Empire against the Christians. The first one was under Nero. The second one was under Domitian. Ironically enough, when Paul writes his letter to us telling us that we need to obey the authorities placed over us, he wrote at the time of Nero. When Peter is writing, he's writing at the time of Domitian. Quite honestly, um, we don't have any leaders in America and, and haven't through the life of this country that have been as evil as either of those, at least not toward the Christian church. Let's, let's look at uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Hmm. You know, the one that called all the Jews out of Judah and Benjamin and took them to Babylon and made them his slaves. Remember his vision and God speaking to him and said, you're going to be like an animal until you acknowledge that I'm the one that put you here and you serve at my will. Do you remember that? He served at God's will to do atrocities to the people of Israel, to God's chosen people. Now don't get me wrong. These people think they got it in control, they're going to do it themselves. The Assyrians, when they wiped out the ten northern tribes, 712 BC, they thought they had it all. They were doing it on their own. God had already said, I'm going to raise up the Assyrians. They're going to come out of the north. They're going to wipe you out. They are going to unleash on you my judgment. And then, I'm going to raise up the Babylonians Actually, at that time, they were the Ur of the Chaldees. That's where the Babylonians came from. And I'm going to have them wipe out the Assyrians to pay them back for doing harm to my people. 
So the Assyrians accomplished God's purposes, thinking they were doing it of their own. And the Babylonians accomplished God's purposes, thinking they were doing it of their own. Do we really think that God doesn't have it in control? That God doesn't know what's going on? That we need to remind him that they're not doing things the way we think they should be done? He knows. He knows. My prayer has turned from God fix them to God speed us on to the end so that you can come back quickly. Do what needs to be done so that you can return quickly. Give us strength to endure. Give us strength to endure. So earthly masters. <clears throat> Servants, be subject to your masters. He doesn't just say the good ones. He says all of them. The good and the unjust. He even goes so far as to say, you know, you might get thumped for doing good to them. You might be abused. This is to your credit. This is to your credit. We have a cultural idea here that we need to stand up for ourselves and defend ourselves physically in a confrontation. Let me challenge you with this. If you are doing what God has called you to do, and they're thunking on you for doing what God has called you to do, who's better at defending you? You or him? Honestly, who's better at defending you? You or him? Who's the example that we are set to follow? It's not Mike Tyson. It's not Bruce Lee. The example that we are set to follow is Jesus Christ, who didn't even open his mouth. But, 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 look, that's the cost that you have to consider when you become a Christian. Peter. Jesus is arrested. He follows him in. He's scared for his life. Hey, aren't you the one? Hey, I heard you. No, 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 no. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Not me. Not me. No, no, no. Fifty some days later. Fifty some days later. Two months. Two months. Flip over with me to Acts. I don't want to show you something. We're in uh, Acts chapter 5. These, these apostles, they were in the upper room. The Holy Spirit came down, filled them up. The, the church is born. And they... Start doing what? They go out and they preach. They preach everywhere. The Jewish council, the religious council calls them in. Not like, hey guys, can we talk to you? Like, thump, 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 follow me. Okay? So they're brought in to the Jewish leadership council. And they say, what are you doing? You've got to stop this. And they say, we can't. It says, uh, verse 29. It says, but Peter and, uh, Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him in his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And they said, oh, okay, good. We just had a misunderstanding. You're free to go. <laughs> I'm glad you clarified that. Where can we sign up? No. It says, when they heard this, they were enraged 
and wanted to kill them. Gamaliel steps up, says, hey, look, there's an easy solution here. If this is a man, it's going to die of its own accord. There's not going to be enough to keep it going. But if it's of God, we don't want to be against him. So let's just, let's just wait and see. Gamaliel, I think, was a very smart man. Do you, you know where else we hear Gamaliel? Yeah, he's the one that taught Paul. So, he, he kind of lays out before him. And it says, uh, down in verse 39, he ends up saying, you might even be found to opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Now, we have this idea of self-preservation. We have this cultural identity that we stand on our own two feet. That we take care of business. Listen, that's an American ideal, not a Christian ideal. And I know it's hard to understand. And I know some of you go, okay, so what if somebody breaks in your house in the middle of the night? What, are you just going to let them beat on your children? Honestly, I don't know. Honestly, I wrestle and I wrestle and I wrestle with this. Because Glenn in his flesh says, no, I'm going to get up, I'm going to shoot him. Bang, bang. End of story. But Glenn that reads the word says, God, how do I trust you in this? How do I trust you in this? Thankfully, he's never put me in that situation up to this point. Thank God he's never put me in that situation. Because there are very few things that you will see me come completely unglued at. And two of them are mess with my family. Two of them. You mess with my wife, you mess with my children. Okay? You will see me come unglued. I thank God that he's ringing about in me a change. Okay? Because, see, it's not enough that I just trust God with my life. I have to trust him with theirs. I have to trust God with their lives. If it was okay for Peter to be abused and rejoice and consider it worthy for his faith, who am I to say that it's not worthy for my children to be abused for that same faith? Who am I to say that? Now, back in Peter, he talked to the unjust masters. He carried that same thought down to wives who were living with unjust husbands, people that don't follow the word. He carried that same thought to husbands whose wives may not be following the word. He carried that through to life. What, what is the example that is set for us? Jesus, who when he was being beaten, when he was being tortured, when he was being killed, didn't even open his mouth to defend himself. This is our example. This is the way that we should be. Now, there's one other thing I have to address. I have to address so you don't walk away with any misapprehensions. Up unto sin. You obey up unto sin. You cannot sin. Okay? Let's, let's look at this example that I just read in Acts. Okay? I'm going to back up just a couple verses. We started in 29. I'm going to back up to verse 27. Okay? It says, And when they brought them, they sent them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying... We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have, fulfilled, you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. 
Okay? So see, would you say the high priest was an authority over Peter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. He was the God-appointed spiritual authority over Israel at that time. Don't get much bigger than that. Was the, was, was the high priest perfect? No. No, not at all. So he says, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. You can't do this. But what does Peter say? See, here's the difference. Here is the difference. And this is where we have to be very sure of things. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. We must obey God rather than men. Now see, here's where things are shaded. And this is where we actually, quite honestly, I've seen a lot of people run into trouble. I've told this story before. When I was about seven years old, my dad was not saved. My mom was saved. My dad told my mom, you're not taking my kids to church. They stay here. Now, a lot of people's response is, well, i got to obey God rather than man. So I'm taking my kids to church. And you don't like it? You can lump it. I can't honestly tell you for each and every situation what God would have you do. But I think God worked a marvel in the way that he dealt with my mom and dad. My mom honored my father. She said, okay. So every Sunday, she would gather all five of us up and we'd go into her bedroom. And she would, do you guys know what an auto harp is? Mm -hmm. yeah. She had an auto harp. <clears throat> and she would play the auto harp. And we would sing our songs. We would sing praise and worship songs. And back then it was choruses which had seven words, and you repeated them 62 times. <laughs> which is great for five children, you know, like nine and under. Because you don't have a whole lot to remember. And we would sing praise and worship songs. And then she would open the Bible, and she would read to us out of the scriptures. And we had our own Bible services at home. Now, this, this didn't go on very long. I, I'm thinking maybe four or five weeks. And my dad had it up to here. He's you guys got to stop. Take them to church. <laughs> Get that out of my house. <laughs> but I want to show you, God honored my mother in this. He honored her. God will protect you. He is the best protector you will ever have. Trust him. Okay? Trust him. Was my dad in sin, telling her not to take the kids to church? Yeah. He was a sinner. He wasn't saved. That's his whole life. That's all he knows. When you are dealing with people that are sinners, don't expect them to act like Christians. They don't have God's Spirit to illuminate those things to them, to teach them, to tell them, no, you shouldn't do that. Okay? So expect that they're going to get it wrong. And some of them are really nice people. And they're really nice people on their way to hell. So we obey. Up until the only point that God has ever given us an allowance to not obey is when he tells us to do otherwise. Now, I'm going to caution you. You have to be careful with what you claim God is telling you to do. Because I know of a situation where a wife got saved and the husband did not. And she was on fire for God. And bless her little heart. She went to every Bible study there was. And her husband didn't get much to eat because every night there was a Bible study. And he finally told her, look, I'm, I'm glad this change in you. I'm glad things have turned around. But he said, I, there's some things that need to be taken care of at home. I can't do it. God has told me I need to do these things. Well, I'm telling you as your husband, there are things at home that need to be addressed. We and the kids would like to eat sometimes. We and the kids would like the pleasure of your company sometimes. Maybe once in a while, something could get cleaned. I have to obey God rather than man. <coughs> and they ended in divorce. And I will tell you now, 
Her sin was egregious. Her sin was egregious. Because God, while He did say, yeah, you have to fellowship with the, the saints. He, uh, he has laid that down. He also said, you honor your husband. He also said, you honor your children. See, you can't just pick and choose the commands that we obey. We don't get that option. Be very careful with what you lay out is, oh, God told me. Because if it's in here otherwise, you and I need to talk. <coughs> or seek counsel, not from someone that agrees with your opinion. Do you ever notice that? We always go to the people that we know are going to agree with us. <laughs> seek godly counsel. Maybe you missed it. Maybe you missed it. We're not perfect. Not, none of us are perfect. We, we all blow it. That's okay. John tells us that's going to happen. He says we all sin in many ways. He doesn't even just say we all sin sometimes or occasionally. He says in many ways. That's the marvel of the grace of the cross. Is that that's covered. He, he's, he's, he's got that. Okay. But when you start laying things at God's feet so you get to do what you want, I think you put yourself in a very tenuous situation. Very, very tenuous. Stick with what's in black and white. Don't in some of your Bibles, red and white. Make that your basis. Everything operates from there. Okay? If you're not sure, seek counsel. Seek counsel. Okay? So, obedience, upatal, hearken, listen, pay attention to, act upon, Husbands, do your part. Love your wives as Christ has loved the church. Giving up your life day by day by day by day by minute by minute by minute by minute on her behalf. Wives, honor your husbands. Submit to the authority that God has placed over you. Trust God. Trust Him. Parents, Rear godly children. Don't frustrate them. Don't frustrate them. Don't, don't lead them to a broken spirit. Children, honor and obey your parents. How can you tell me that I honor and obey God when I don't honor and obey His commands to honor and obey the other people that He told me to do that? You can't. Employees, work for your employer as unto God. Because ultimately, He is your employer. He got you that job. He is your source. Employers, keep in mind, you also will give an account. You also owe to your customers as unto God. As unto God. And there are rewards for doing it right, people. There are blessings for doing it right. And there's an accounting for doing it wrong. Okay? Let's pray.